in the life of uh, our mother, and Chama is here, and I and my sister Ora is in Eretz Israel in absentia feeling uh, what's going on here this evening. I spoke to her this morning when we were learning together, and she wishes us well. And um, everyone uh, really knew my mother and participated in some way or another, welcoming her to the shul and helping her in different ways and sympathizing and also admiring her. It is now hard to believe, but it's the eighth year site of my mother. Wow. She, I know the dates because, uh, because she uh, passed away three months, a little less than three months before our first grandchild was born. And Eliana was pregnant at the time. And I remember that my mother was really ailing and feeling like she was already missing my father and was ready to go. And she would tell me, it's time for me, it's time for me. And I would say to her, oh, Ima, we really need you and we love you and we're so close together. And don't you want to see the new baby that we're expecting in just a short while, Eliana's giving birth? So my mother looked at me with a kind of a look of great disappointment. She had not reared me well. What do you mean? What do you mean do I want to see? It may be that you won't see me, but of course I'm going to see. You don't think I'm going to see? It was so it was so obvious the way she had her spirit, the way her neshama was nurtured, you cannot hear me. And I was told that I needed hearing aids. Uh, I'll raise my voice. Um, so come closer, can, there are seats right here. There are seats right in front of us. So it was so obvious to her. Here, her neshama was a, a different kind of neshama. And she, she really knew that she would be seeing. So we are not just in the presence of each other and in the memory of my mother, but we are actually in the presence of her presence. Um, I, want to, I want to acknowledge that. And, uh, so, Ima, I hope that we do justice to some of the things that we will try to reminisce about. And I want to tell you how this came, this format came to be. You know, we've had other shiurim over the years from my father's yard side and my mother's. Um, and there was a time, years ago now, that I befriended the Kranzlers and fell in love with personality and the shama and feelings and depth that I was able to experience with them. And... Um, and comes along a CD that uh, that Ellie created and composed the songs with it and sang with his daughter. And I listened to the CD and I loved it. But not only did I love it, but I actually put it on one of my little portable things with a little earphones and I would go to the gym. What am I going to listen while I'm going to the gym to keep me busy? I listen to the CD, where you are with me, of Ellie Cranston. And it would be on one of these shuffles, you know, where you put it on and it's to be repeated. So I go an hour and a half, sometimes two hours of gym, and this thing is reverberating in my mind. And it was beautiful, and it continued to be beautiful. But there's something that happens after a while when you hear something that is moving and spiritual over and over again that is very much unlike our davening in the morning. When you daven in the morning, it's a zoom before you know it, it's over, right? But if this, these things started ringing in my ears, you know, and I didn't actually hear it, it was in my brain in my heart. And after a while, the words began to register. Things that you know, every one of you will know the words. But uh, they brought thoughts to me, to my mind. Some of them are really related to the things I want to remember about my mother. And so we talked about whether it would be nice to try to see if we can meld hearing and really listening to a few songs and then reminiscing about the meaning of the words of the song and then re as it relates to my mother's the memory of my mother. Still have to raise it a more? What do you no, say? Okay. Oh, what what, what do you say? You want to add something? Shh. <laughs> I think it's worth mentioning um, when we went for Slichot and we brought your mother and father along with us to Riverdale. <laughs> That's right. My mother, my mother experienced. And she danced to Ellie's singing oh. and it was absolutely an amazing experience for Ima. She couldn't stop talking about it. The, so the, the, you way, made the way the spirit was us, rising in the place yeah. led by Ellie. So you, yeah, it, that's right. So she already experienced that too and will experience it again now, right? So we talked about that and we have chosen about four or five songs 
And what, it, what I hope will happen is that as we not necessarily sing the song unless you know it, listen to the song, but really hear the words inside, deep inside, and you will see how we try to make something of it. Yeah. This is Ellie's music. This is, of course, this is composed and performed. So, Bakasha Rebbe. Should we start with the movie or should we start with the movie? Maybe, maybe we should start right away. Because okay. I thought that was going to be a warning, but this is good. So, just a word of introduction. Um, first of all, it's a scoop to be here with you, Judy and Yehuda, and um, to give honor to your Yima and her presence. Um, this CD is really about tefillah and masora. Um, my father, Olav Shalom, was a master of tefillah. He had a close relationship with Akash Baruch And my relationship with Akash Baruch and with tefillah is a, a function of the masora that my parents gave over. Um, and one of the key <coughs> ideas for me is, you know, Davka, that when we daven, we do kind of move through the davening often. Um, I try every day to find a pasuk, to find an idea that kind of jumps off the page and that somehow it becomes um, a, an exploration or a theme for the day. And um, so these songs over a number of years were the product of that exploration, um, an attempt to slow down, an attempt to dive in and to, um, to really experience um, the inner meaning of, of Tefillah. Um, the Tlomo once said, um, don't, uh, don't turn the pages, let the pages turn you. And that's, you know, that's, um, that's a goal. So I think there's, there's, there's two ways to say shot in a Pasuk. One is to think about it, and to come up with a cognitive understanding that's new, and each day to explore it in a new way. And then I, I also think that um, exploring the musical message, finding the musical pshat of a pasak, is, for me, a way to um, enter in to the dominant. So the first song, we decided to share is the title song of the album. Um, I should mention that it was an album, as you said, that, that our daughter Ravital and I um, uh, worked on together for two years. And that's really part of the Masora idea. I think the giving over of music is a very, very important part of parenting, whether it's our Shabbos tables, Mirot. Um, the, the family Nigunim, and Dafka, this experience of working together on harmonies, on developing music together for two years, is, it was a, a project of great love and, um, and importance um, for me, certainly. So this is the title song, and it's um, to the words, Gam ki yelech begeitza mavet lo ira ra ki ata imadim. Though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not afraid because you are with me. And because you are with me is the, kind of the theme of this album. <laughs>
thought about this song, and you know, of course, it's that famous psalm, Hashem Ro'i Lo Echzar, that we sing many, many times in the week uh, before Kiddush, and it's Rosh Lashit. And it takes place in a, uh, in a time and a location that is very, very troubling in the life of uh, David Melech. He's pursued by Shaul, who's going to try to kill him, and he finds himself down somewhere among the canyons down near Yama Melech. Uh, we can hike there, probably. And Nachal Cheret, it's called in according to the Medrash, is a place that's desolate, inhospitable, frightening, uh, full of shadows and no water and nothing growing and a dangerous place. He's there all alone and he's also very frightened because the soldiers of Shaul are pursuing him and who knows when he's going to be trapped in this canyon and will they start shooting from above. And night falls. And here he is stuck, and he's going to sleep. He sleeps with nightmares of great danger, and every time he looks around, a little bit of the shadows in the moonlight, it looks like the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. These little rocks with shadows and nooks and crannies, who, lo who knows what is hiding. And he falls asleep. And then he wakes up in the morning, before dawn, just as the light is beginning to creep in. And here, at this moment, comes two different views about what he actually encounters when he wakes up. One Medrash takes literally what he says, What happens is that he wakes up and suddenly in the place of this desolate, horrifying place, canyon, is green, water, plants, grass and flowers, beautiful. And he says to himself, and he's revived. Rather than be afraid, he realizes now this is a miracle. This obviously couldn't happen in the real world. Hashem must be giving him a signal that he is with him, that he's going to take care of him. And therefore, he has nothing to fear anymore. His security is assured. He's going to be okay. So he says, Hashem Ro'i, my God is my shepherd, as we translate it. Shepherd, a shepherd brings the sheep to grass, right, and waters. He has brought me here, and he's grown this grass and fl flourishing place for me, and he will take care of me, like a shepherd takes care of his flock. And therefore, I'm going to be okay, even though I had walked in the valley of the shadow of death that this was. I am no longer afraid, because now I know that God is with me, and he's going to take care of me. That's one view of what's happening in this Midrash, much more mystical, miraculous, right? The other view departs from this completely, and the other view is he wakes up in the morning, nothing has changed. He wakes up to this same desolate, frightening, inhospitable, infertile, dry, dead place. But he, in the night, and seeing a new day begin, and that he lived through the night, he gets a new feeling, and he reminds himself, David, David. You've been through many, many things before. You've seen many frightening things when nobody else dared to go up against Goliath, right? And you did it. Why did you do it? Because you knew that God was with you when you were going to do God's work. You weren't going to let him get out, get away with, uh, you know, punishing and, and shaming the God of the Jewish people. You've been through a lot. How is it that you let yourself become so traumatized? I mustn't be like that. I must remember that Hashem is not Ro'i, my shepherd, but Re'i. The Ramban says, there's no Vav in that word, by the way, the way it's written. It's Re'i. God is my companion. God is with me all the time. He has been last night. He has been when I was sleeping, and he is here again right now. Nothing's changed except that I now realize he's been with me all along. All my life he's been with me. And now, as long as I know that I have this contact and bond with him. I don't know whether I'm going to live through this. I am in the valley of the shadow of death. It is the same valley, but because I may be like Sharansky in a dungeon, and I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I know I shall fear no evil, because God is with me. God is with me. How do you know that God is with me? Because I feel God is with me in my, in my soul. Right? And that kind of feeling 
is a much more that the, the way we interpret the, the, the uh, capital in this way, I think, is much more, uh, what should I say, real and helpful to the average human being. You may be going through horrible times. A person may be suffering great illness or great danger or be in a dungeon or be in the middle of a concentration camp or be in the middle of whatever. Difficult <coughs> divorce, uh, loss, loss of loved ones. And there is nothing more sustaining and consoling than knowing that in the middle of this you can actually feel the closeness of God and therefore you need not fear. When you feel that contact with the Kadesh Baruch Hu, that is the second of explanation of this, you might actually even hear his voice. You might actually even be so close to him that you know what he wants you to do. And I want to think about this in the context of my mother. My mother was running away from the Germans from her town in Novotarg to go to Warsaw to try to get a marriage license. She had just married my father the night of the Blitz, of the beginning of the attack together, on Poland. Together with, together with my father. And they're going in this train towards Warsaw. The, the attack on Poland was sustained and harsh. And this was the last train that was going to be able to come into Warsaw. The siege was beginning to close. And as they were riding in this train, many times this train was strafed from the air. And uh, attack planes would come. And at one point, the attack was stupendous, the way she describes it. Bombs were flying all around. Bullets were flying in all directions. And everybody who had a brain got under the chair in the train and tried to hide and get away. Bullets were flying through the train. My father was going to do the same thing. My mother was told by her father before they left to go to Warsaw, I want you to know that I will always be with you. I will always be with you. Remember that Yiddish phrase. She says to us, she tells us this story, she says to us she was standing there and seeing everybody hiding under and she says to my father, we're getting off the train. We're getting off the train. And she grabs him, and they jump off the train, with the bullets and the bombs blowing, goes across an open area, jumps over a, a big, it looks like a barricade, lies down, looks back, and the train goes up in flames. Now, she felt, she felt something. She never explained it. She thought that her father was talking to her must, must go, must go. The fear that everybody else would have is somehow just not there. She overcame it because of the feeling that she had. She was in contact with something that is beyond understanding. When she got into Warsaw and they were there, the bombs crashed and the whole city was destroyed. They were the last people coming into the city. And they were hiding out in a little apartment and this building remained somehow standing all the buildings around them were rubble by the time the siege was over. When the siege was over, the Germans marched in and they started uh, organizing the town. And there was food being distributed in these uh, you know, uh, rationing places. And uh, of course, they're rough and tumble people and the ghetto was not yet closed, and, but everybody was afraid to let the men out because men would just be grabbed to do all kinds of slave labor right away. My mother went out. And she goes to this food distributing place and she sees a Nazi officer who's being bombarded with all kinds of questions by people who didn't know yet what the Nazis were like, right? And um, saying, what are we going to do? Where are we going to do? How much food are we going to get? Where are we staying? How are you have to take care of our building? And he, she remembers, he sort of looked a little bit of a sympathetic type. He sort of said like, oh, what am I going to do with all these people giving me so much trouble? It sounded like a little bit of a, an emotional person. She says to herself, i got to go to this guy. And she walks up to this commandant, and she says to him, we just got married, my husband and I, we don't belong in this town, can you tell me how to get back home? Knowing what we know, you understand what's going on here and who she's approaching, and he says, come with me. He leads her into the police station, which was taken over by the Nazis, and he takes her to the back room, and he shows her a map, and he says, there's a train tomorrow morning before dawn over there. Be on it. You can go back to your town. He says, thank you. Goes away. Goes back to her apartment. 
there's a curfew. You're not allowed to get out of the house after sunset. Mm -hmm. On pain of death, nobody's allowed to be out. She tells my father, we're going. We're going to the train. Really? We're going to the train? Yes, we're going to the train. Nobody else would dare to go except for two young men who were ready to come with her. They walked at night, like in the movies, you know, flitting from open door to, to, to a rubble building to keep out of sight of the police. And she goes and goes and goes. Two of the boys behind her were actually picked up by a roving police. Nazi police, and they end up at the end of the town, go to the train, there is a train, they get on the train and they get back to their hometown from which her father smuggled her over together with her husband, with my father, over the, the border to Czechoslovakia and they survived. That's a long story how that went on from there. But I'm trying to give you an example of a person who takes initiative, but besides that, who feels somehow something inside is telling her that she's got a support. She's connected. She's connected. And therefore, Kiatai Madi overcomes barriers and gives people a message about where they ought to go. So that song, that drash of this basuk, anyway, speaks to me and speaks to me about her. Don't forget, don't forget that our uh, Saba, her father, was to her also a very holy person. He was uh, always uh, learning, or a chazan, he was a chazan too. And, so his uh, voice would reverberate and, uh, in her mind. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll come to him a little bit. Yeah. The connection to Hashem is what I meant. Oh, yeah, yeah. The snake and Shochenat, um, I wrote in my grandparents' home when I was, I think, 19 or 20 years old. And uh, my grandfather somehow connected to the snake and would always ask me to play it for me. And it's the beginning of uh, Shachrit and Shabbat, uh, Shochenat.
song. It always bothered me the the, the diction of this prayer because it says, "Shulchinad Maron v'Kadosh Shema." Hashem is awesome, transcendent, holy is His name. You would think after you say that there's nothing more to say. And then it says, Vikatu. Now usually Vikatu, when you quote a pasuk after a statement, you usually mean to prove the statement that you just made by quoting a pasuk. But it says Vikatu Vranu Sadikim Bashem, which doesn't tell you why he is awesome, transcendent, and holy. Right? So, of course, that bothers you, but when you look at the pasuk, it doesn't say kakatuv, which is usually, when you want to prove a point that you have said, you say, I believe that such and such and such, like kakatuv, because I can quote you a pasuk, as it is said, such and such, right? But it doesn't say that, it says vikatuv. And it says that the tzadikim will sing in God. There's the answer, right? Because this is as though to say, God is transcendent, ineffable, unbelievable, holy, distant, awesome. And, and, at the same time, nevertheless, so to speak, Rananu, Tzadikim Bashem, Tzadikim, sing in God. And I want to, in other words, they can sing in God, even though He is so incredibly awesome. Vikatu. I want to mention too that Rananu is a song without words. Rina is melody rather than song. We, could, we, we In English we would say song is the same thing, but this is melody. They sing songs without words. Shira is a poem or a song like Shira Alayam, for example, at the sea, but Rina is a, a, a joyous melody song. The Tzadikim are somehow able to be in touch and to be close to, related to what we said until now, with God, despite His awesomeness. And they can, they don't need words, because their song is a, an inside heart song, without words. And I want to emphasize also, it doesn't say they sing to God, Lo, Rananud Sadikim, Lashem, now that's something even more awesome, right? You do a heart song inside God, you righteous ones. It's, it's, to me, it's an incredible juxtaposition of two phrases that otherwise just don't, make, don't make sense and make a lot of sense now. And as a matter of fact, there's another Isaiah in Pasuk that says, and the Chachamim say, the quote in the Gemara at the end of one Masechto, that one day at the end of days when people pass away from this world, that Sadiqim will sit around in a circle, Sadiqim again, these same people, they will sit around in a circle and God will be in the middle. And they will each point with their finger and they'll say, Hinei Eloheinu Zeh, there he is, our God. Now you don't say unless you know your house. You say that right? I, I've been there. I know it. I live there, right? That's my chair. That's my book. That's it. You don't. You, don't, you point to something, right? Not I believed in him. You know? Don't you all know? It's Sadik next to me. Don't you remember him? You remember him? We were with him before when we were asking him for salvation. We were with him. So it, I was in, I was in his home. I was in his home, right? So I recognize him, right? It's an incredible thing. So these are the tzaddikim that, despite Chochinad Marom Kadosh Shemo, are Rananim, heart song inside him, with him, together with him, intimately with him. And I want to tell you. I mean, some of you were at the Shalashudas last night. Uh, don't, don't, don't. I have to tell that story. No, you can't. Too many people already heard it. No. Who, yeah, first of all, none of the women heard it. You right? can tell it again. Uh, Dove didn't hear yeah. it either. It was a very uh, there are quite a few people who didn't hear it. I'll, I'll try to... The kids are... <laughs> I don't know how to do these things, but anyway. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to tell you a story. My, my mother told me stories about her father and mother, told us stories about her father and mother, to the point where we can actually almost touch them and know them. 
even though I never, you know, he was murdered. But then I found out a story that she never heard, because it's a story that takes place after she and my, and my father had escaped, and they were stuck, the rest of the people were stuck in the town, eventually evacuated, many killed in the town, and eventually the town is gone, right? So my aunt, who was to marry my uncle, another son of this family, of my, my Your mother's brother. My mother's brother. was the only other one who survived after the war. The rest of the family was killed. She came to visit them, Pesach, after the Nazis were in town. Right? And she was an Aryan-looking woman who can come and go. She's blonde, blue-eyed, didn't look like she, uh, that she was a Jew. And she went and hid in, her, uh, in their apartment, in their house, and they went to the backyard and they baked Erev Pesach matzos with Hallel singing in the backyard. In the middle of the Nazi occupation, with the Nazis around, she was sort of like, didn't know how to find a comfortable spot, what's going to happen next. Comes evening, and they start the Seder, and there was a curfew, evening time, all lights out, right? Otherwise you get picked up. So my grandfather, she says, I want you to know what he was like. He put sheets and blankets on the windows, the lights were burning, and he had a Seder, she was there the year before, she had a Seder that was no different than any Seder he's ever had. His voice, because he was a cousin, his voice reverberated, he was transported, he was in another place. And it was like nothing was going on. He was doing Rina Ala Ba'ashem, because he wasn't here, he just wasn't there. She also said that when they went back to the town, and, and they were killed eventually, right? And she was able to wander about and escaped. Married my uncle. My uncle and she went back to visit the old town of Novitark. And in Novitark there's a little, after little the stream war. after the war. And they wanted to reminisce about, my uncle wanted to show her, you know, this is where they live, this is where they live, they visit the cemetery. And at night they're standing at a bridge over this, uh, this little stream. And they're talking to each other quietly, and they're dressed like Americans, naturally, you know, they look like they're strangers. And an old Polish guy comes walking by, and he sees these people who don't quite belong, and he says, in Polish to them, says, what are you doing here, who are you? So he says, uh, I'm actually from here, my uncle says, so, you know, I was born here, I was raised here, I just came back, uh, you know, my parents were killed here, and so, so this old Polish man says to him, Oh, yeah, really? What was your name? I've always been here. What was, what was your name? So he says, uh, the family name is Kalb. The man steps back. He says, Kalb? Are you related to Abraham Kalb? The old man Abraham Kalb? He wasn't such an old man when he was killed, 50 maybe. Abraham Kalb says, yeah, that's my father. He says, well, let me tell you something you don't know about your father this old man, this Polish man said. What do you mean? He says, well, I was working in the cemetery as the gardener during the time the Nazis were there. That was my job, so I continued to do that. And I was raking the gravel at the entrance to the cemetery, and one day I see a soldier, a Nazi soldier, prodding two people by their back with his rifle, pushing them forward, Jews, move! And it was your father. They recognized him. He was involved in shkita and so on. He had bought animals and meat from the uh, local farmers. And he sees him approaching the gate, and the man is pushing and pushing them and making all kinds of vile language at them. At one point, he says, I saw your father, straightened up, turned around, and he looked this Nazi in the face, and he said, you're going to stop pushing us you're going to let me stand here and pray to my God. Like that. And this Polish man thought, of what's going to happen next? He sees the soldier back up, put his hands down, and says, go ahead. Right. My grandfather turned around, said, Kriyachma, I suppose, we do whatever they did together, holding hands with my grandmother. And then, without looking back, slowly walks forward, and he was killed in these graves that were dug up and prepared for these people. And to the Pole, this was remarkable. 
right? A man who was so free and so connected to what was inside of him, right? He knows he's dying on Kedush Hashem. He doesn't want to be... And he was able to, by the force of his conviction and his, the force of his neshama, to actually make this guy back up, right? So, Ranut Tzadikim Ba Hashem, I think, speaks to me this way. I mean, it's a yurt side of my mother, but we don't even know the yurt side of my grandparents. And, and, I, and I think of them as somehow connected in terms of the product and the masora that you're mentioning, of what actually came from one to the other and flowed through to the other. And when I see Shochinad Marom V'Kadosh Shemo, Ranut Tzadikim Ba Hashem, this is one of the things I think about. Just had the Kriyasa Torah yesterday, uh, the Torah Shem appears, but Yaakov Om Vayaronu. Vayaronu is also without words. Yeah, they it's call out, it's very, very good, that's a great quote from this Parsha, Vayaronu, right? they, they, they hurrah, they, they sing out. It wasn't words. Very good. So now I think we'll hear this Pasa completely differently. Let's go back. <coughs> six days at a time. Ki sheshet yamim asa Hashem et ha-shamayim yet ha-aretz. That God actually creates the world anew each week. It's based on Shabbos. It's based on us keeping Shabbos. The lease on the world is renewed and the world is recreated. And then, the next morning, I'm davening, and um, in Shachris, it says, HaMachadesh B'tubo B'chol Yom Tamid Maseh Bereshit. 
Actually, Akash Baruch Hu creates the world every day. He recreates the world every day. But he creates it with tuba, with goodness. The ingredient of creation is goodness. That's what Akash Baruch Hu renews the world with every day. The tuba is that with his goodness, no? Mm -hmm. With his goodness. With his goodness. So, um, that pasuk jumped off the page that day, and um, this melody connected to that creation idea, the idea of Hashem's goodness. The creation created the melody. Right, exactly. Sing this song. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. Wait, I will try pick to up, pick up to see if you'll understand. <laughs> just, just to say, uh, you know, she wasn't singing in uh, in public and in front of uh, uh, mixed audiences. And I, I said to her, Ravi Talashin gave you this unbelievable gift, and somehow or other, it has to be it has to be shared in the world. She, uh, she was willing to, uh, to record this album. We see the world is there. What do you mean he recreates it? I see the world. The table's still there. 
So he comes up with an idea that, you know, in medieval times it was always thought that the world is made up of, everything is made up of four different elements of air and earth and fire and water. And the only difference between your jacket and this chair is that the combination of those four elements is just a little bit different blend, right? Change the blend and it uh, could fall apart or become something else. If you like, Aram, in quantum mechanics, there's always some uncertainty about what's going to happen next, right? So he says the Kodesh Baruch Hu actually manipulates constantly, every second, but to him it's instantaneous all the time. Matter and its juxtapositions are being sustained and repackaged. It was a pretty uh, dynamic, if you put it in modern terms, it's fantastic because they're... You know, there's all kinds of energies and motion all the time, right? Happening and antimatter and matter is always in conflict. And it's, a, it's an interesting, a fantastic idea. But then he, he mentioned something that really struck me. He said, Bituvo is really an interesting word. You say, with the goodness, that is the ingredient that makes the world created. But he says something a little different. He says, bit too low. He says, try to imagine a man who goes into business, right? He invests millions of dollars into his business, and the business goes from bad to worse. He's losing money, he's losing money, he's losing money. If he invested a great deal, he doesn't want to walk away from it right away, because after all, there's still something left. But after all, he wishes he didn't do it. For goodness sake, if I ever had my druthers, I never would have started this. Now try to imagine the Kaddish Baruch Hu, who is observing what's happening now in his wonderful universe, with his wonderful humanity, despite the great hopes he had and dreams he had for us and for all humanity, or at the time of my grandparents and these stories. Imagine the Kaddish Baruch Hu saying, at every instant, the Baal is saying, should I turn the switch off or should I sustain? instantaneously. So bit to go there is with his ultimate incredible goodness and faith and optimism and patience and parenting feeling of love for this little universe that he created with all of the terrible tragedies of pain and suffering and renegadeness that we have. Right? Bit to go. He creates it all over and over and over and over again. Something which is stupendous and un unexplained, right? And Judy was talking about, what, what does my grandfather... <laughs> she uh, she's just exploded my mind. She said what she would feel like at that time, if she was the grandfather, she would start feeling the pain of the Kaush Baruch Hu to see what is happening here. <laughs> Now, <laughs> okay, Judy is in another stratosphere, right? <laughs> to feel the pain of the Kaddish Baruch Hu looking at the world when he's, I'm just going to die, right? But the Kaddish Baruch Hu, what's he, he's, he's worried about him too. Judy was more common to, Judy. to uh, the Alexander Rebbe's understanding of the first Pasuk. Gam keelech de geitz al lo ira, said the Alexander Rebbe. He was being sent to jail. And he said, I'm not afraid. But Ra Kiyatai It's so sad that you have to be it's with so me. It's so sad in this that, you have to go, <laughs> that you have to go to jail with me at Kaddish Baruch Hu. Yeah. So we'll go that, for it. That, These uh, are the Shamos. Because are... Imo Anochi Vitsara. Who was it who said that? Was, who said that? I believe it was the Alexander Okay. No, no. <laughs> so, Judy, you come from some holy source. So, so th this Tuvo. Now, there, there, it is a joyful song, right? It's not like the sad songs we mentioned before. And what I wanted to concentrate on when I heard this song is, what does it take for people like my mother and my father to come out of where they were and to hear that they lost their parents and come with nothing out into the world, right? Lost sisters, brothers, and parents, and home, and come and find themselves in Eretz Israel and feel stimulated, optimistic, to create a family, to build a happy home, to have three children. Even our names are very amazing, you know. There's Nechama, 
first child, Nechama. What do you think was in their minds when they said that, right? Second child, Yehuda, Apam Odet Hashem. They didn't know yet what they had to thank God for. It was such a but but they, Apam Odet Hashem, the gratefulness, right? And Ora, the third one, I finally see light instead of the darkness. You know, just, you know, I, I, the, the names speak to me, right? And they had a family, they had a family in which they knew how to play with us. They taught me how to ice skate. They didn't know how to ice skate, but the, so they put me in the charge of two French Canadian girls in, in this ice skating ring. They said, Could you teach my little boy how to ice skate? And they stood back there, these two European people, and made sure that I was able to enjoy it, right? And they loved nature, and they hiked, and they traveled, and they saw beauty, and they couldn't get enough of it. My mother was just couldn't get enough of the glaciers and the snow and hiking. Maybe we can go a little farther. Who knows what we can see from the top of that peak? Let's go a little over there. Uh, so the optimism and the and the hope and the goodness, and then the the little glimmers of redemption that they would be sensitive to. Yom Hatzma'ut to them was like. We knew that there was really goodness in this world. We knew that we were going to get there. 1967, it was like, to them, you could see their buoyant uh, feeling of betuvo kol yom tamid. Regardless of anything, there was always this hope, this positive movement forward. So, mechadesh. They were able to be mechadesh their life. Yeah. Um, we're going to do Ptah Libi uh, How are we doing? Well, it's an hour. Um, do you want to skip that one and go to uh, 10 and 9? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I have one other thing, but. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, not a melody of mine, and you will all know it. But uh, in honor of the, the heroism of your parents and the whole generation, my parents and grandparents and all their mishpachot. And in looking forward to the ultimate redemption, you will see two, these are going to be two parts. One is the traditional animamin that you all know, and then the next one is harachaman hu yezakeinu, which Ellie did compose. So let's do the first one first. Actually, the Harachman is, is a song that Rabbi Shlomo composed that I put on the album as a tribute to him. <laughs>
the full text of that song is Ve'afal pi she'it mamea Im kol ze achak elav b'chol yom she'yavo Right? I believe that he's coming and though he come and tarry I will wait upon his coming My mother wouldn't have liked this song because she didn't believe in waiting Waiting was not her thing you know, she adopted a Hebrew name. Her name was Slava. Well, Slava means glory in Polish, I think. She adopted a name, Shalva, which is in Hebrew. In, uh, in benching. And this Nusach, it's an unusual one, that Reb Shlomo write, wrote this melody to. It's not just Harachaman who is a Mashiach, who is a That's what we normatively say. But this nusach is harachaman hu hu yizakenu v'chayenu v'karvenu v'yimot ha-mashiach. B'karvenu? B'karvenu. What does that mean to you? B'karvenu? Is that a verb? Yes, so... It, she it would either, make it a verb. Right. We, it be, in, it our bringing, or in, in our bringing, or in our bringing close right. the right. coming of Moshe. She in would have liked that big carvenu. Right. So do you. He will make us merit. Worthy. He will make us worthy. Right? He will help us to act in such a way that will be deserving of. It's not something that's going to come. Right? And that would have been my mother speaking, right? Right? Become worthy of it. Do something. Don't wait for it. I want to tell you a story, just one little story to end this. Uh, I think. She was in uh, this apartment in Warsaw. The bombs are flying. Fires are burning. People, animals and people are dying in the street. The city went up in flames. I mean, you know the history of Warsaw during that siege. This building in which they were, she says, stood and was not broken, and everything around them was rubble and bricks. In fact, a huge bomb fell, she said, in the back, in the courtyard of this building, and they looked, and there was this dud of a bomb, and it was as big as that table, sitting there, and never exploded. And it was a Robertson's house, a relative, a cousin, and she was in this building, and it was Yom Kippur. The bombs are flying, they're davening. 
after Yom Kippur, there were all kinds of people hiding in this little base medrash of, the chaz, of, a, of a Rebbe who had died and his wife was living there with her daughter. And they were stuck in this place, and who knows how many people there were stuck, in, and everybody had to hide wherever they could. And the one man there was from Israel, right? German, Yakish guy, very well dressed, and she remembers he had a nice cane. And my mother says, forgot his name, and she says, the man gets up after Yom Kippur and he says, Nu Chebra, we have to build a sukkah. <laughs> they look at him like he's out of his mind. The sukkah, the bombs are flying, the fires are burning. What do you, what do you mean by sukkah? There's a little tiny, he said, there's a little tiny um, fire escape type of thing behind this apartment. We have to make a sukkah, there's a sukkah. So says, you're nuts. He says, listen, it's Yom Kippur, right? The bombs are flying. And what will you do if in a few days the bombs stop? And there's a truce, and it's over. What will you do and you didn't build your sukkah? So he shamed them into building a sukkah. He got up. This is an older, venerable man with a suit. You know, he always kept himself very clean, very polished. Yucky. He, they took rubble from the buildings that fell during the lull between bombs, and they built a little sukkah on this little place. They looked on the top of the base medrash's uh, Aron Kodesh, and they saw an old lulav that was dried out and dead. And there was a etrog that was used for besamim, you know, somewhere dried up. And they took what they could and they put it on a little table in the sukkah. What would happen, you can't write this in a book, you can't make this up, air of Sukkot, the bombs started flying, stopped flying, and the Germans entered the city. The war was over, for Poland, right? the occupation began, quiet. As you see, I told you. So they have a sukkah. And they have this meager little bit of food that they were able to get and they put it on the table. And they come out there and then with tears in their eyes they make the bracha. And then they take this lulav and this etrog, just to try to imagine, and they're crying and they make the bracha. Right? And they shake it. And the word got out to the survivors from these bombs about, you know, the Rebbitzin has a sukkah. And there's this little old lulav and etrog there. So my mother, remember this? My mother said, for blocks, there were people standing in line to trudge up this one building that was standing up the stairs, come to this, and even everyone had lost somebody, and everybody had lost their house, and everybody was penniless, and everybody was destitute, right? And they came over there, and they, they kissed this little old, you know, dried out, Lulav and Etrog. And then went out, and another person would come in. And this man, when my mother heard about this, uh, this uh, way to get out of town, so she says to him, come with me. I mean, you're so confident, and you have such optimism. Come with me. We'll break the curfew. We'll go. Remember, only two people came with him, not this man. He said, no, no, no. I'm staying here because my family is going to send an airplane for me from Israel, and they're going to take me home. He stayed, and they left, right? And they got away, and they went to Novotark, and they went over the border, and they went to Czechoslovakia, and they went by illegal ship to Israel, my mother, and she was imprisoned by the British, and they had, uh, finally, they got out, and they got into a life in Yerushalayim, right? This is like a whole year. My father's sister was hiding out in the mountains during this time of the war, and she survived. There was a youth group of, of, of uh, Haganah people who were organizing Youth Aliyah and Hachshara people, and they were going to bring them into Israel. In order to bring a relative into Israel in those days under the British, you had to have somebody sponsor this person, you know, because they didn't want somebody to be on welfare when they come. So what are you going to do? My parents had nothing. How are they going to vouch for this sister to come? Didn't Abba so, do something? And so, so, we're coming to... So, Abba... Before oh, yeah, this, yeah, the home, the home, this sorry. Very my, this man, that's right, and this man told my parents, when you get out, and you will survive, when you get out and you go to Israel, that's where my father had come from Israel, and they're going back to Israel, 
find my family and tell them that I'm here waiting for them to come and pick me up and to where, take me to where right? and where I am, right in this house. And in Abba Warsaw. left way before England. Abba left, ended up in Israel. My mother was on this illegal ship. Short story, but he goes to this family, rich people sitting in Yerushalayim, and he tells them, your, your old man is there waiting for you. And he knew nothing more. Then when my, his sister was going to come to Israel and needed somebody to vouch, so he goes to this, he said, who's going to vouch for her? So he goes to this home, right? He knocks on the door, and a butler comes to the door. He sees this waif of a father, my father, you know, who was just a delivery boy at that time going to university, young married guy. He says, we don't, we're not interested. So he said, I'm, I'm here to see Mr. whatever his name is, Rothschild, right? And uh, the, the guy was going to slam the door in his face. He put his foot there, and he says... He hears a voice inside. Who is that? Who is that called my name? Right? Let him in. And there's this man from the Warsaw Tower. He was connected with tea. And, and yeah, he's some kind of a tea. big tea magnate. And he says, come in, sit down. And he tells him the story that an airplane was paid for to come from Cyprus to Italy to Warsaw to pick him up. A lot of money must have passed hands. They came conducted by a police uh, Gestapo car to pick him up, take him to the plane, and fly him to Italy and Israel. Kachaze. He tells him the story. He says, what can I do for you? He says, I have this sister who needs a voucher. Oh, of course, and he's come. What can I do for you? And he takes his paper, and he writes, and flourishes, and that's how my aunt came to Israel. Your aunt who was in Kvaritzion. Who went to Kvaritzion and started the first people who came to Kvaritzion who were eventually uh, and overtaken and revived again today. To which my parents brought a Sefer Torah to contribute afterwards in the name of her parents. Circular, circular circles. But these are people who, who are Tzofim, right? They see something good regardless. They see that if I act maybe things will happen, right? And it's not our job to know whether the bombs are going to stop flying before Sukkot, but it's our job to make the Sukkot. Right. As, again. Before going into that, can I just sing a verse of a Yiddish song that my father used to sing at the circus? The Sukkot la Kleina, from Breta lach Gemeina, Habich Mira Sukkot la Gemach. It's a story of a, a broken down sucker. Oh, goodness. And the daughter comes in and the wind is blowing. It's on, it's on a rooftop. And the daughter is frightened and says, Tati, the, the sukkah is going to blow over. And the father responds to her and says, Don't be afraid. This sukkah has been standing for 2,000 years. Huh. Mm. Mm. So this is, That's this is just, this is, this is that sukkah. <laughs> Oh, 